Just got done wa wa watching with half of Meet Kevin's, I'm going for a walk by the way, uh, video on uh, Schiller, Robert Schiller from Yale. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so Meet Kevin was using a Schiller data set that says in September 2008, institutional investors and individual investors thought a crash was imminent at some percentage point. I'm like, huh? But well, September 2008, he goes, that's before, essentially before the crash. No, it's not. That was, the crash started October 2007. VTI was down 37% from October 2007 to September 2008. So I don't give two craps what people thought in September 2008. We're already in a significant bear market. <laughs> people, I don't get it, man. People, I, I just... I, did they not remember? Were they not around? Schiller was around. I, you know, I haven't read Schiller's research. I just frankly could care less. What I'm saying is, so, man, if you're freaking worried about a crash in September 2008, well, it was too late. It already happened. You were down. VTI was down 37% from point to point. You had maybe 2% for dividends. So let's say down 35%. <laughs> so, I mean, September 2008 to uh, March 9th of 2009, it fell another, what, 25%. But the bulk of the murder already happened. You already got smoked. So you're sitting there, I'm worried about a crash, September 2008. I <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad data point, who cares? Ah, oh, just, I hate that stuff. Because people seem to overlook the fact that was October 2007 that we started the decline, all right? Uh, and we only got out on March 9th of 2009 because of Barney Frank, I'm telling you. The video is Barney Frank saved capitalism. Mark to market accounting, that's what was causing it. Barney Frank said, we're gonna have a congressional session on mark to market accounting, and lo and behold, the markets immediately found liquidity. I wonder why? Anyway, so then we go back to the uh, beginning of the aughts. It really wasn't until March of 2000 that that NASDAQ fell. So NASDAQ was up to 5,200, if memory serves, in March of 2000. All right, so everyone and their mom thinks it was January 1st. No, it was not. It was March of 2000 when the market started falling. And then it got smoked all the way until September 2001 because we got smoked by the terrorists. Now, 20 years later, we're still taking our shoes off. The whole thing's dust. But anyway, it wasn't until March of 2000. Then we got smoked by the terrorists. And then it went into 2002, where the big damage was felt. However, it wasn't until March of 2003 where the bottom came. So it seemed to be a little bit of a dead cat bounce at the end of 2002 until... Uh, and then we had the, the dead cat bounce at the end of 2000. Then the, uh, 2002, then the market proceeded to decline again at the beginning of 2003. The point of this, you're going to hear all kinds of guys that say, look at this, this data set says that, that data set says this. It doesn't mean crap. It doesn't mean crap, man. Your data set is irrelevant, especially if you're not using the data set correctly. It's more like, what were people saying September 2007? That's the relevant data. Not what they're saying in September 2008. When did Greenspan utter irrational exuberance? 1995. Or was it 94? I think it was 95. Either way, we had five years left of 30% growth each year for the S&P 500. Or something like that. All right? Schiller, he, he published his book, I almost want to say March of 2000. But he'd been writing it for two years previously. So it's not like he just woke up one day and penned a book on March of 2000, and the next day the market got tanked. Could there be some luck there? Absolutely, absolutely. I don't know when Schiller said the real estate bubble. I, I don't know. You'd have to say, hopefully he said it in 2007. I think it might have been 2005, six, something like that. Either way, none of these guys are spot on to the month, never mind the day. So if you listen to Greenspan, for instance, and you got out of the market in 95, you missed a significant, probably the most five-year run-up we've ever had. When Schiller was first writing his book, Irrational Exuberance, roughly 1998, you missed another two years 
of significant growth. And by the way, it was only large cap growth stocks that got pummeled in 2000, 2001. Just look at the Windsor Fund at Vanguard. That did just fine in 2000 and 2001. It's 2002 when it got spanked. But even if you were irrationally exuberant, you didn't get hit until 2002. All right, and that was because terrorist attacks. It certainly wasn't because of high PE ratios or bonds, the Fed raising rates on bonds. That wasn't happening. Anyway, so I, the whole point is all these guys say this data set should, and I'm not saying me, Kevin said that. This, this thing just kind of bored me. Um, actually, these guys, a lot of these guys bore me. Um, I don't know. It's uh, these young, I, it's going to sound bad. These young guys, they, uh, I, I just, how can I say this? I remember I was at USA and there was a guy who sat across the cubicle from me who uh, said he read The Economist as a badge of honor. And I said, dude, <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyone who reads The Economist and says they're now somehow uh, educated in worldly affairs is, is not. It's, I mean, it's just, it's, that's not. I remember sitting there thinking, uh, did I just hear you say to some guy that you read The Economist? I'm like, oh. Anyway, so that's kind of my feeling with some of these young guys, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. No, I, again, the Wall Street Journal editorial page is how I learned or cut my teeth when I first got out of the military, and I'm glad I read it. And I would still read it if, uh, if I subscribed, but their anti-Trump narrative and pro-globalization narrative has, has, uh, has turned me away. And they got rid of a lot of the guys and ladies who used to be on the editorial page that I liked quite a bit. I think Paul, is Paul Gijo, Gigo still on there? I think he might be, I'm a big fan of his. I think he might be, but I'm not sure. But they, uh, they brought some Never Trumpers on and I just don't read it anymore. And one of the reasons, frankly, is because I don't subscribe. I'm sure if I subscribed, I would read it because they're always at least against the mainstream media, which is fantastic. But, uh, but be it as it is, most of my research is done by reading white papers and PDFs that people send to me um, or that I come across. I like that because you can see the data points in there in terms of, all right, why is this guy saying that? Why is this guy saying this? Why is this lady talking that? You see what I'm saying? Um, but just reading Economist in the New York Times, that doesn't, uh, in of itself, I got to see more than just that. Let's just put it that way. All right, anyway, the data set... Are they irrelevant? In this case, I think September 2008 absolutely is. All right, we'll see you.